Hello, everybody. It's good to see everyone in, in the Zoom, Zoom space. And uh, how's everyone doing? Thanks. Belly's full. It's hard to, hard to do this after lunch when everyone's uh, energy's a little low, so I'll try to wake you all up. Um, yeah, thank you for that nice introduction. Um, as Steffi said, I'm, I'm Dr. Mark Stone, and I'm in the Department of Civil Engineering, Civil and Environmental Engineering. And I work primarily on water issues and issues related to the environment. So that's what I want to talk to you about today and uh, just give you a feel for the kinds of things that we do in our department and, and uh, perhaps, perhaps that it's, it'll surprise you a little bit, the kind of stuff that we do. So maybe it's something you'll be interested in as you think about what you want to do with your lives post COVID once we try to get things back to normal a little bit. Uh, this is a picture. Does anyone know where this is? Have seen this area before? I'll give you a hint. It's in New Mexico. Not everybody at once. They're kind of a quiet group. <laughs> yeah, I'm noticing. All right, well, I'll give it away for a moment. I'll try to warm you guys up. I'll try to try to build um, some com some uh, um, comfort with me here. So this is the Rio Chama. So it's in northern New Mexico. A very beautiful river system. As Steffi mentioned, we work all over the world, but this is still one of my favorite places. And uh, this is, this is a picture from one of our drone flights because we do a lot of work with drones to collect remote, collect data in remote areas where otherwise it's, it's hard to reach. Okay. Um, there we go. So this will be tough for a very quiet group, but I have nowhere to be this afternoon. So I'll, I'll just sit here and wait um, to get some feedback from you guys. But I think you've been in this camp for a little while. So I think you've heard from quite a few professors and experts and people like Steffi and Elsa about the field, field of engineering in general. Can anyone tell me what an engineer does? Broadly speaking. Solve problems. Ah, thank you. Definitely, engineers definitely are, are uh, problem solvers. I think that really is at the, at the core of it. So, you uh, gave me the perfect transition to my next slide. But absolutely, at, at the core, there's a lot of different specialty areas and a lot of different applications for engineering. But at its core, engineers are problem solvers. Okay, so that's what separates us from some of the other disciplines that have other, other um, goals. So this is just an example of the types of problems that we're interested in. Problems that are facing humanity that we're trying to make a difference. Okay, so these, these are known as the United Nations Grand Challenges. So these are well-established and recognized challenges that we're, that we're trying to face. Okay, so more specifically then, I'm not expecting a thousand um, responses to this, but maybe one or two. Can you give me yeah, no, I mean, of what civil and environmental engineers do? They design systems to help uh, all the, the environment moves smoothly, kind of. It's a good answer, very good answer. Yeah, anybody else wanna contribute? Well, it's a good thing that was such a good answer, so we can move, move forward. Because, yeah, I think that was a very nice way to put it, actually. So when you think of the words civil and environmental, that does explain the types of things that we do. Civil is just short for civilization, right? And the environment is short for the environment. I guess it's not short, that's what we do. So when, when you step into the Department of Civil and Environmental, the kind of work we do relates to the needs of society. So some engineering disciplines might work on um, designing a faster car or figuring out a better weapon system or de developing um, uh, new medical techniques. You know, there's all different emphasis areas within the engineering world, but what keeps us together, our, our unifying goal, is that we're always focused on civilization-related issues. So when you think of the types of projects that we work on and who's paying, who's paying for the engineer to be involved, usually it has a really strong community component to it. And the, the student put it really nicely that we're, we're working to develop systems that, that help us be in better harmony with our environment so that what we do doesn't have a negative impact on the environment, 
and also things that are in the environment that could be dangerous for humans like bacteria or pandemics or or floods etc that we have mechanisms to protect ourselves so it's all about that balance with the environment this is just some of the focal areas within our in our department i won't go through each of these i'm going to focus on the water one obviously that's what i'm interested in but you know all of these have that same theme to them where we're we're working to develop systems i'm glad that you use the term system for what we do because um, everything's connected is really a lesson within the civil and environmental field so if you make one change over in one of this one part of the system it's going to have an impact on another part of the system so if you put in a new building in uptown that's going to have an influence on the rio grande and we want to understand those connections and we want to try and make sure that any negative impact that we that we have on the system can be avoided so with that i want to transition into talking just more about water issues it's what what I do, it's what I spend all my, my time on and all my, my students are focused on research and education topics related to water. And this is a global map that gives you a little bit of a feel for which parts of the world have the biggest challenges when, when dealing with water. And as the statistic shows up at the top, so the world's population right now is, is uh, around seven to seven and a half billion people. So over half of the world's population is living in areas that are considered water, water scarce and where there's water stresses that are both a challenge for the humans that live there, but also when humans live in places that are water scarce, we tend to overuse that resource and therefore it has a negative impact on the environment. So in these reasons that are showing up in the, in the bright colors, those are places on this planet, which you can see it's a lot of it, where, where this is a, a major concern and where our research team and our global partners are trying to make a difference on this on this challenge but unfortunately the challenge isn't getting any smaller i, I think your generation is very aware of of the challenges that we face due to climate change my my hope is that your generation is going to be able to make more progress than some of the generations that came before you because the consequences are getting very severe and, and this is still a topic where the progress is coming too slow. And in New Mexico, unfortunately our monsoon is, is finally kicking in, but the main consequence of climate change when it comes to water at least is that we have a lot of variability. So as you, it's already a place where we have a lot of variability, but due to climate change, we are now experiencing more severe droughts and more severe floods. So when you have those two things uh, going against each other, it makes it really hard to make sure that you're managing your other resources well. So this, this is really the bottom line to the, the types of, of uh, projects that motivate us and, and where we're trying to make progress. And if you take a little closer look in the United States, we are in the middle of it. So by some measures at least, New Mexico is, is one of the most stressed, if not the most water stressed state in, in the entire country. And I think you have probably seen it living here that our resources are really stretched thin. If you go down south just a little bit, go down towards Socorro, what do you think the river, the Rio Grande looks like today? You have to take a life jacket to go across it. It's really uh, like the water's really low. Really low. In some places, it's completely dry. Okay, so that's that's not really an acceptable condition, right? It's not really acceptable for us to to need to remove all of the water from our from our ecosystems to maintain to maintain our communities. So it's critical that we find better ways to do these things going forward. So this is really a motivation for us. So I don't, I don't wanna make this sound really negative. My, my point is that this is our motivation, that this is a challenge that we see and we wanna be part of the solution. And that's really what we're working towards. So within, within our research group in the Department of Civil, it's actually Civil Construction and Environmental Engineering. I just don't work much with the construction um, part, of, part of this, but civil construction and environmental engineering. 
these are some of the main topics that we focus on. And um, I think that some of you might find these topics interesting and maybe be something that you would, would like to be part of the solution as, as we face these, these challenges. And I'm gonna give a little bit more time to each of these. So this is my overview, overview slide for some of these problems. But we work on wildfire related challenges. We work a lot with the concept of resilience and I'll describe that in a little better detail as well. And as I've already mentioned, climate change is another topic that we spend a lot of our, a lot of our energy trying to contribute to, to uh, improving the situation. So I'll start with climate change. There, there are so many different aspects to climate change. It, it you know, requires everybody being, being engaged and trying to address this challenge that, that most people will agree is, is the biggest challenge facing humanity right now. As you know, in, in the moment, we're, we're quite um, distracted and, and understandably so by the pandemic because it's, it's having a terrible impact on our communities and our economy um, in the moment. But you know, the, the, we'll hopefully move past this challenge in the next year or so, if, if we're hopeful. But in the meantime, climate change is, is continuing to march on. And when you look, look into the not too distant future, uh, this, this is a challenge that we're, we are not going to escape. And there's, so there are many different components that we work on in our team. So I'm just gonna highlight a couple of them. On the left, one of the major points of emphasis of, of our research group is trying to improve our understanding of how snow, snow and snowpack is changing, especially in New Mexico and Colorado. So we have research teams that go up into the mountains and spend a lot of time studying the changes in snow patterns, the, the changes in snow characteristics, both to improve our understanding of impacts of climate change as, as it influences where, where we have snow, but also to improve our ability to estimate what that's going to mean for water resources because snow is important for a lot of reasons. A lot of us like to go skiing and enjoy time in the mountains during the winter time, but for the state of New Mexico and really all of the American West, snow represents our major water supply. And the, the high mountain snowpack serves as a natural water tower where water is, is accumulates all year and then it slowly it slowly melts off into the spring and summer, and it helps to sustain our rivers long after winter has ended. So a major uh, challenge with that is that as temperatures are rising, our snowpack is being reduced, we get more rain and less snow, and we lose that storage, we lose that natural water tower that we normally expect. So that requires, um, on the upper right, this is one of my closest collaborators, Dr. Ryan Webb, requires guys like him to sacrifice and to go backcountry skiing into deep into the mountains in order to get their measurements with ground penetrating radar. They work a lot with NASA. They use a lot of remote sensing products and are really trying to better understand this challenge and to develop strategies to cope with this. Another main emphasis of our group is wildfires. So we've, we've had a fairly good year in New Mexico so far. We're not completely past our wildfire season, but with the monsoon starting to really kick in, our wildfire risk will be reduced. But you've probably noticed all the smoke in the air for the last six weeks or so. Does anyone have uh, sensitive lungs? I do. When, when the smoke kicks in, oh, I feel terrible, right? So where was all that smoke coming from? Wasn't there a fire in uh, Arizona? Arizona. Arizona had three huge fires this year. So one by Flagstaff, one by Phoenix, and one by Tucson. So hundreds of thousands of acres burned. So the immediate risk is that you'll be near the fire and you could be impacted by the fire itself. Another risk is if you're downwind of the fires, like we are here in Albuquerque this year. So your health can be impacted by, by being in the, in the smoke zone. And then another risk that we focus on primarily is after there's a wildfire, we typically get very severe flooding because the landscape can't hold that water anymore. We've lost all the vegetation 
and also the soils have been destroyed and they develop a condition known as hydrophobicity where when the water lands on them it runs off almost like it was on concrete except that it takes all the, the mud and debris and ash with it. So when you have downstream communities that are at risk we need to have better methods for predicting that risk and measuring that risk and being able to communicate that risk to the communities that could be impacted. So this is, this is a picture in Cochiti Canyon, which is one of our research sites up by the Tent Rocks zone of some post-fire, post-wildfire flooding from the Los Conchas fire. On the right is some field work that we were doing up at Taos Pueblo to try and better understand this issue and to be part of the solution for how communities can, can work with this. And then the last topic, I'll go over this quickly because I feel like I'm talking a lot. But you guys are quite quiet, I can tell. So maybe I should just keep talking. I'll go somewhere in between. So it's the topic of resilience. And when we talk about resilience, what we mean is we are trying to understand and improve the ability of different types of systems or infrastructure to absorb and bounce back from different uh, stressors, such as natural disasters, global pandemics, climate change, et cetera. So whenever you have some type of a disturbance to a system, such as a wildfire or an earthquake, in general, engineers are interested in how the system will be impacted by it. But when, when you approach it with this a perspective of resilience, it's the, our focus is more on understanding what can be done to help systems respond. And to, and to come back from these disturbances as quickly as possible. Um, this map down here on the right represents one of my favorite projects. This is a collaboration that we have with 12 different countries that are all looking at what we refer to as headwater systems. So these are mountain systems, like I was mentioning, where snowpack is so important. And we are, we are attempting to improve our understanding of climate change and other, other problems such as um, fracking, um, energy development, mining, urbanization, et cetera, different challenges that are felt along the, the high mountains of the Americas. So we have partners and research sites that span all the way along this colored zone that starts in Calgary up in Canada and goes all the way down to Patagonia. Uh, last week we spent, I was supposed to be in, in Peru right now, um, I'm not, I'm sitting in my kitchen instead um, because of COVID, but I was, we were supposed to be in Ecuador last week and Peru this week to be visiting our field sites and working with our collaborators to deploy in advanced sensor networks to, to advance this research. Instead, just like you guys, we ended up on Zoom for a week, um, <laughs> bouncing around between breakout groups. That's just the way it is right now but eventually we'll be back in Peru. So when you feel too bad about being stuck in your house right now, just think of poor Dr. Stone and how he didn't get to go to Peru. Maybe it'll make you feel a little better. No, I'm not feeling the love. Well, I feel bad for myself, so. No, it's just the way it is. We, we, we will be resilient and a year or two from now, we will, we will be in Peru and we'll be moving forward. So the last thing I'd like to talk about is I kind of talked about the problems, but I want to talk a little bit more specifically about what we do, right? What do, what do you do if you're an environmental engineer on a day-to-day -day basis? And so we use a lot of different tools. One, one of the categories of work that we do is what I call advanced instrumentation because we have several different components to it. So we do a lot of work in the field. This is my student, Nilu where we are doing what is re referred to as real-time kinematic measurements out in a river where we're measuring river characteristics using mostly satellite links. We do a lot of drone work. Yesterday morning I spent all day uh, in the Rio Grande where we're doing um, advanced feature mapping of how the river is being impacted by the monsoon and that work is entirely done. Well it's a combination of, of drone work and field data methods because whenever you do something with remote sensing you need to have something on the ground to prove that you're right and to be able to describe any errors that you might have. And then what I'm referring to here is team building is, is um, that most of our work is in pretty remote places where we need to go camping together, we need to go rafting together, we need to sp spend time in the wilderness in order to get our data 
But of course, that also gives us a chance to become a stronger team. This picture is actually um, a group of our collaborators from Mexico. This is a, a photo I took last, last um, August. They were supposed to come back this August. Of course, they can't now, so we'll be doing Zoom again. So it won't be quite as fun as rafting down the Rio Chama, but I think you get the idea. And next year, we'll be, we'll be back out there. Um, we also work a lot with data and building models. So it's kind of break it down of what I'm calling computation. But several different components to this. One is we use a lot of remote sensing data. I already mentioned drones, but we also use a lot of satellite and airplane-based instrumentation to describe what's happening on the ground. This is a study using machine learning techniques and artificial neural network technologies to predict and describe wildfire patterns using remote sensing um, space, space satellite based uh, data to look at smoke patterns and for early detection so that we can more quickly respond when there is a wildfire. On the upper right is a project that we have in Mexico in the Colorado River estuary in Baja where we're investigating changes in the river flow due to all the water that's pulled out and sent to places like Los Angeles and Las Vegas. And we do a lot of numerical simulations and the kind of work we do is very intensive calculations. So most of that work is done in collaboration with the supercomputer network at UNM known as the Center for High Performance Computing. And then finally, what might be a little bit in, you know, closer to your near futures, I wanted to highlight some of the educational activities that we have. So, um, taking a few minutes out of my day to talk to some of our summer camp participants. That's a that's just a fun a fun diversion, but not uh, not how I spend most of my day, right? Um, but here's how we do um, some of our our uh, more regular teaching experiences. On the left is a field class that we teach up in the Valles Caldera every summer, except this year because of COVID. I wonder how many times I can say COVID in this talk. But uh, the but we teach a summer field class where the students learn. The basic principles here at UNM and then we go up and we camp in the back country for about a week and the students do a, a bunch of monitoring in order to understand all the cutting edge instrumentation so that when they graduate from UNM they know the, the latest techniques and they they are trained on the latest instrumentation normally we also except because of COVID we normally go to Europe and teach a resilience course that has two different components to it my uh, colleague teaches a class in Germany that focuses on transportation networks. And so they're in Germany for two weeks and then they move over to Holland and that's where I teach, where I teach a class called Life Below Sea Level, where the Dutch have learned to le live with water, where we investigate different strategies for managing water resources in, in uh, difficult environments. So with that, that's kind of what I wanted to throw at you guys. You know, at the end of the day, if you remember a thing or two, it's that there might be some opportunities and there might be more diversity and more going on in, in civil and environmental engineering than, than you might have thought about um, in the past, that we use a lot of the same tools that are used in other fields of engineering, like advanced computing and instrumentation and modeling. But when we use those tools, we're using them specifically for these types of problems where we're, we're, face, we're trying to face and, and improve our abilities to respond to the needs of society and, and the environment. So this is, I'll leave you with this. This was my, where I was a year ago right now. This is one of our research sites in Patagonia. This is one of, uh, this is a lake, obviously, it's called Laja Lake, uh, up in the Andes in a really beautiful location. And uh, with that, I'm, I'd love to take any questions you guys might have. I noticed, you're right, it's a quiet group, but I'm sure there's some questions. There's one question in the chat. What other kinds of engineers do you work closely with? Mm, great question. Um, personally, I work most closely with, with people in um, computer, computer science and engineering because of the modeling um, thing. The work we do related to modeling um, and artificial neural networks and also electrical engineers due to the work that we do with sensors, advanced sensor technologies and internet of things type approaches. Those, those um, applications require a high level of expertise and here, I'll, I'll stop sharing my screen so we can see each other a little better. Um, and it's, it's um, what's nice being at a place like UNM where you have expertise in all those different areas so it's easy to reach out. But I'll, I'll point out though that 
I work more with non-engineers than I do with engineers. The, the, I work with biologists, economists, sociologists, political scientists, biologists, maybe I said that already, chemists. Um, whenever you're dealing with water, it, it touches so many different parts of society that you need to be able and willing to collaborate with people with really different backgrounds than, than your own. And, that, and I really enjoy that. That's what really draws me to the field. Does anyone have any other questions? I thought your, when you were talking about your machine learning and neural nets for uh, ember spotting and smoke, that reminded me a lot of the COVID uh, work trying to find where you know, new outbreaks were happening. Yeah. Absolutely. In fact, we're working with people who work on that issue as well. Um, they're the same people that are working on the smoke. So we've, we've been working with Picard's Labs up in Santa Fe. Oh, yes. Uh -huh. And they're doing both some of the best work in the country related to spotting and tracking the COVID pandemic. And they're using those same techniques as it applies to the wildfire questions. And that's, you know, it's, that's a, um, a good example of how those, those computer scientists have the expertise in, in the numerical algorithms. They, they can set up tools that help to answer questions, but they don't have the expertise on the topic necessary. So they can work with an epidemiologist on a virus outbreak, and then they finish up that Zoom call, and then they're on a call with me talking about wildfires, because to them, they're using a tool. And for us, we're trying to solve it by using their tools and applying them to a specific problem that we have in mind. So it often works that way in, um, in the STEM fields. Could you um, also uh, tell the students about the big hydraulics table in the basement? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, so one of our, one of our um, another one of the tools that we use to solve these types of problems is we do laboratory experiments as well and so normally for a group like this if it wasn't for <laughs> coronavirus <laughs> coronavirus <laughs> mixing it up um if it wasn't for the virus and we were all on campus we would have had this meeting in our laboratory and you guys could have seen it but we actually build scaled models of flood control systems mostly around albuquerque but we do build models of other of other cities as well so that we can test and improve flood control practices. So it's, it's a really nice way for students to get involved because it really is building models in the laboratory. We use, we use a lot of CAD and 3D renderings and 3D printing and, and um, um, you know, a lot of hands-on creative problem solving in order to build these models and test them. So it's a great way for students to get involved and a really fun part of that is that those projects usually were the last stop. The projects have been designed and then they bring them to us to test them and make sure there's not a problem because when they build a project in the real world, it costs millions or tens of millions of dollars. So it's better to test it in the laboratory before you build it in the real world. But that means that if things go well, those projects are typically built in the next year or so. So the students get to build a model in the laboratory, test it, and then they get to see it constructed out in the real world really quickly, which is very rewarding and it helps them to make connections between what they see in an engineering drawing and on a computer and then to see it in the, in the real world is, is a nice experience. So this table is enormous and the, you know, it's like little monopoly size <laughs> pizza, well, I don't know how big, but um, it's just amazing that you can have something on that little scale and it really models things in the, in the real, real world. Yeah, our, our table is about 50 feet long and 10 feet wide. And that we build, and sometimes that's not big enough. Sometimes we have to build out on the sides to make it big enough or extend it to make it long enough. And yeah, we actually have a model set up there right now. So if it weren't for COVID, <laughs> we'd be able to so, show it to you. Yeah. Mark, when did you know what you wanted to do? Well, I'm still figuring that out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> As you can see from all the different projects that I work on, my interests get scattered all over the place because I'm a curious person. But I think from about the time I was the age of the faces that I see on my screen, I knew I wanted to work on environmental issues. 
That's, that's what I knew. Um, I was the first in my family to go to college, so I didn't know what majors were. I didn't know what an engineer was. I didn't know anything as I started applying to colleges. And I found engineering almost by accident and then realized, wow, this, this is amazing because I can work on environmental issues. Um, I can work on really challenging problems. But engineers also have good job security. And you know, coming from a family that didn't have very much growing up, um, having a job at the end of college was really a priority for me. So that was the balance. I wanted to work on something that had to do with real world problems and natural resources, and water. But I also had this feeling of, I want to make sure that I, that I have a job when this is all done. And engineering has, has, has solved that problem for me. Now I get paid to do what I love. Oh, that's great. I didn't know that. Do you do work with Sevietta at all? I have, I have. So Sevietta, has this group had any interaction? Yeah. So Sevietta is a, a long-term, it's, it's two things actually, it's a wildlife refuge and it's also a long-term ecological research site that UNM manages uh, between here and Socorro as you drive south on, on the freeway. So they have been um, observing environmental change and environmental processes for 20 or 30 years down there. And we have done um, some research on the Rio Grande there. We've actually have designed and constructed river restoration projects in that area, and then looked at how effective those are for um, attempting to recover the endangered silvery minnow. But that, that work wrapped up about five years ago, so we don't have any current work down there. My, my story about Sibby, when I, I went there to visit and they had just moved some prairie dogs down there from Santa Fe and people from Santa Fe were sneaking in and feeding them trail mix. <laughs> and they were supposed to learn how to, you know, how to survive on their own. <laughs> I the behavior of people from Santa Fe. It's yes, yeah. Community. So anyway. I don't know if on the calls from Santa Fe, but <laughs> community. <laughs> so does anyone have any other questions no okay well thank you so much mark and i'd also like to point out um from so mark is part of a, a big uh research project that we have here from the national science foundation and um, yeah. some of your uh stipends are coming some of the some of your stipends are coming from his grant so you should thank him <laughs> because you're getting paid from his grant, which is very nice. Yeah, I mean, everyone's, everyone's welcome, but um, that's exactly what we want to do with it. That's part of our, our goal is, is to reach out to bright young minds like, like all of you and uh, to hope, hopefully motivate you to, to really stay focused on school and to look for a career route that'll be rewarding. And, that, that'll open up opportunities for you and give you chances to, to travel or do whatever it is that, that you're most excited about. So the pleasure is all ours to have this interaction. And yeah, another um, group that does similar work at UNM is Engineers Without Borders, and they go to Bolivia, and they used to work on one of the reservations. I don't know if they still are anymore. Um, but but they would mostly do civil engineering type, you know, bringing water, fresh water and uh, uh, solar energy. So, um, you know, even if you don't want to be a civil engineer or environmental engineer, you can still participate in that, that kind of uh, club. So, yeah, absolutely. okay then, uh, we're going to have a...